Ah, hello. Uh, my name is Katharina Vons, and I'm a lecturer in jewellery and metal design here at the university. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my PhD research today that I completed a few years ago. Um, but I'm really going a little bit further back than that, uh, starting with my undergraduate degree show. Uh, and for my undergraduate degree, I discovered the material silicon. Um, and I started making these huge body pieces that were based on all, all sorts of sea life and shapes found in nature that were a little bit repulsive, but also quite attractive to me. Um, and that's where the idea came from that I wanted to make things that really come alive on the body in some way. Um, and this was back in 2006, so uh, it, technology wasn't quite where it is today. A lot has happened since then. Um, and I've, I've been, I kept being enthusiastic about weird and odd things found in nature, like these kinds of mushrooms here. Um, I photographed everything I saw, um, and especially exotic mushrooms became a focal point of my work. Um, and that was reflected as well in, in my work from my master's degree, where I started to get into 3D printing. Um, and that was kind of about the time when 3D printing became a lot more accessible to people in 2009, 2010. Um, and I really wanted to experiment with that. Um, I also started looking at all those natural things I was seeing under the microscope. I started drawing from things that I put under the microscope. And, and taking photographs that really emphasize the structural details, the colors and the shapes uh, found in these things, like this mineral here is actually a Scottish mineral, um, but absolutely beautiful. <coughs> and that inspired more experiments and then thinking about the silicon and how it could, the, the silicon shapes I should explain are actually not solid, they're actually hollow and they're quite squishy. Um, so it's interesting to see when people touch them. Um, some people love touching them, some are fascinated by them, and others are completely repulsed and, and, and can never touch them again, basically. Um, so I started experimenting with different types of pigments that were available to me at the time. This particular one here has um, a UV active pigment in it, um, and this is what the, the shape looks like underneath um, a, a, a black light bulb. Um, but I felt it wasn't quite enough. My vision was really to create things that come alive properly. Um, and this was about the time when I started to hear about a new kind of material, a smart material. And Lucy has already talked a little bit about this. Um, a smart materials, just to explain a little bit more, is a material that reacts in one way to a stimulus and then autonomously um, reverses that reaction. So it is a material that is kind of alive. Um, and you can have electro electrical smart materials, you can have them as actuators uh, in very functional contexts, but you can also have them in purely aesthetic form, like what Lucy was talking about, thermochromics. Um, and this is what I started to hone into. Uh, and my doctoral research really focused on how can I combine these thermochromic pigments with silicon um, to, to create <coughs> things that I can then put on the body that change color when they're there. Um, so this is, these are just some of my experiments I did uh, with different types of pigment, layering them into different um, color changes. So the three shapes you can see here are actually, that is actually the same shape, just um, exposed to different temperatures. And because I've used two different types of pigments, it can change very, very dramatically um, and go through different stages of colors. And you could do that, uh, you could layer those up infinitely, so you could create almost like a color organ from, just from these pigments that react to different body temperatures. Um, and this is a, another example of a different type of smart material I've used. Um, as, um, a, um, uh, sorry, I'm having a bit of a blackout here. But basically, this type of um, pigment changes according to the body temperature. And you find that in thermometers for babies, for instance, um, where one color represents a particular temperature. And you can see that here in a sort of peacock color change. Um, and, and I started using these pigments in my jewellery, but you can see they're still pretty traditional type jewellery. Well, that, I guess, depends on your definition of traditional. <laughs> but to me, it was still very traditional. So I felt there should be something else there, something even more exciting. And that's the same piece again ha after having been worn um, and heating up. Um, and, and I started making all these pieces. I started using 3D printed shapes in them. Um, and some, some pigments also react to the cold, like this one here, for instance. Um, it goes a very dark blue when it's um, exposed to colder temperatures. So it's not just about heat, it's also about um, the temperature change in the opposite direction. 
Um, and here you can see a piece that's quite dramatic in its change um, using the both types of pigments I was talking about in different ways, uh, some of them on the 3D printed shapes and actually changes very, very dramatically when you're wearing it, that's a necklace. Um, and then you get photochromic pigments as well that change when they're exposed to UV light. They're quite interesting. So you might be in a, inside, in a, inside a building like the V&A, and then you step out into the sunlight and your piece automatically changes completely as you're wearing it. And again, this is the same shape in all of these. Um, the, the bottom and the top, these are always the same shape and just going through different um, changes according to UV intensity. Um, and then the 3D printing revolution happened. Um, you could get started, I got um, my own 3D printer, I built it from a kit, um, I painted it <laughs> light blue and pink, of course, um, and off I was experimenting with lots and lots of different shapes, um, and really the, the, the sky is the limit with what you can do in terms of materials that you can use in these 3D printers. Tomorrow I'll be doing a workshop as well here, showing you a little bit what can be done with 3D printers in terms of making your own jewellery, um, that's heat reactive, but you get, um, I don't know how many of you have used uh, the type of 3BD printer I've shown you, but you basically get plastic on reels, it's a plastic filament, and there are these different characteristics that this uh, filament can exhibit. You've got tactile filaments that are composites and um, look like wood, feel like wood, actually also smell like wood. You get ones that are infused with metals, um, just some that have purely visual effects, colored, metallic, UV active, chromic, pearlescent, you, you name it, it's out there. A very beautiful material. Uh, and PLA is also biodegradable. So unlike oil-based plastics, uh, if you composted it, maybe not in your garden, it might take 100, 200 years to decompose in the garden if you just tucked it in your compost bin. But if you took it to an industrial um, facility, that could be composted in, in a matter of weeks. So it's a little bit more benign on the environment, and I think we should use a lot more of it to make objects that delight us. And these are just some of the objects I started printing out. I started dyeing them. I started um, experimenting with shapes. Um, and then I started to incorporate microelectronics into these. So I wanted to test how could I make pieces that actually respond to what's going on inside our bodies. So this piece here, for example, reacts to the heartbeat. It's got a heartbeat sensor on it. Um, and when you're wearing it, uh, it reflects your beating heart. Um, and you can see that it lights up. Um, it's got an int uh, integrated LED. Uh, and then I started the Hyperhive series of pendants, and these were all the same shape. They all looked a little bit different, but I wanted to test how small can I make these electronics while still um, incorporating them into my um, jewelry aesthetic, um, and how can they maybe change the materials that are um, being used to make these shapes. So this one here is just a thermochromic one, I say, just because it doesn't actually have any electronics in it yet. So that was the piece that started the series. Um, this one here has a tilt mechanism, so when you're playing with it um, on your neck, it starts to light up, which a lot of people play with their jewelry, so that's kind of a way of making it alive. Um, and this is, I just wanted to show you a few of the prototyping circuits. So the Arduino electronics that I use, they're quite large. They weren't really designed for jewelers. Jewelry has many different uh, constraints placed upon it. It's on the body, so you need a really small power supply. Um, you can't just plug it into something. Um, and also in terms of size, a lot of the components just aren't the right size for being placed in re relatively small pieces of jewelry. So this is a prototyping circuit I made of a color organ, which I then um, incorporated, shrank and incorporated into this, um, this pendant here. Uh, it's got a photovoltaic sensor in it, so it measures the light intensity of the environment that you're in when you're wearing it and moving from differently lit environments. So maybe you're moving out of um, a lit room into darkness, the color ins of the light inside the pendant changes. Um, and then I started playing around with how maybe touch could transform these pieces. So this is, um, this is the hyper touch pendant. Um, again, that's the circuit that went into that pendant. Um, you can see a little, um, a little shape there that I'm touching to um, light up the LED. And then my own um, shrunk circuit board and power supply being integrated into the main body. And that piece is maybe about 10 centimeters by five centimeters, I would say. 
And so when you're touching that, that little copper shape, I don't know if you actually saw that, it's, uh, it's just here. When you're touching that little copper shape, the pendant lights up. Uh, and now with 3D printing, we can make sensors that are absolutely anything. Here I've used conductive ink inside 3D printed parts. And the idea is to really integrate electronic circuits in a very visually harmonious fashion into these objects to make them come even more alive. Um, and this is, a, this is another actuator here, a Peltier element. Again, when current is passed through it, it um, cools down on one side and heats up on the other. And I've covered it inside this thermochromic silicon shape. So when it's activated, it, it has a really beautiful color change. And that's my studio where all the magic is up. <laughs> so I thought I'd just put that in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's actually that used to be my studio, now I've moved to Dundee, so it's different, but yeah, essentially it's the same. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. <laughs>